says there is no sin so great it cannot be forgiven. Amen. There is no wound too deep cannot be healed. There is no life so broken that it cannot be restored. And that I believe is for a few people here this morning. And that life made into something beautiful by the healing touch of the master's hand. In Christ, there is always a sure hope of a fresh new beginning with your past totally forgiven as though it never happened. Amen. 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 Father, I thank you for what you're about to do. I submit to you, spirit, soul, and body. Use me as an instrument for your glory. May you people be set free. Father, you came to earth to set the captive free. This day, let it happen. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Last week we talked about restitution. We're going to stay in the R's. <laughs> We're going to talk about restoration. Amen. But not only restoration. <laughs> the story I'm about to go on involves restoration. It involves life. It involves the love of the Father. It involves the choices that we make in life and the consequences that go with those choices. It's a great story. This morning we're not going to go through a whole lot of scriptures because that story is found in a specific part of scripture. And that story, I know you're familiar with it. But I'm going to bring that story with a little bit of a twist this morning. Because part of that story is part of my life. So as I bring this this morning, I want you to concentrate on your life. As the words come out this morning, concentrate on what is happening in your life, what happened in your life, what happened in the past, the choices that you made, and where is it bringing you? Are you free? Because this story talks about freedom also. It talks about a complete 360 in a life. Some people that are here, maybe you've been hurt by people in the past. Maybe you've been hurt by family members. Maybe you've been hurt by bosses, by co-workers, by students in the schools when you were younger. <coughs> the whole story of this today is about that. There was this child in the Bible. Actually, the whole story takes place in Luke 15. Luke 15, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but remember the story about the prodigal son? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we got a lot of mm -hmm, which means that you guys are aware of what's going on with that one. But let me get into it, and we'll see what God does with the rest. Amen? Amen. Luke 15, 12 starts off with the young man coming to the father and saying, Father, give me all of it. Give me my estate. Give me my share. Right there and then, prodigal son's problem started exactly right there. Father gives me. He demanded it right away. And it was his rightful inheritance. It was his. But he didn't want to wait for it. He wanted it right there and now. A lot of times we're like that. We're in the microwave age where we want everything yesterday. We don't want to wait. Same way there, 2,000 years ago. He wanted it then. 
So the father said, okay, no problem. He separates it. The young man made the decision to leave the love and the security of his father's house. He wanted to go on his own. We do the same. We constantly, we constantly choose our own path. Think about, that's why I said before, think about the choices you've made as I go along in the story. Think about the past, because the Holy Spirit is going to bring it. We choose to be independent of the Father's will for us. And when we do that, we do that, you know what happens? We actually separate ourselves from the Father's plan for our lives. All of your lives have been predestined. The Bible declares that. Your lives are predestined. When we choose to go the other way, we're going out of God's plan for our lives. How many have done that here so far? Goes on a little further. Luke 15, 14. After he spent everything, he began to be in need. Uh, as he was spending, how, do you, how many friends do you think he had? A lot of friends, yeah. He had a whole bunch of friends. Everybody was his friend. Because he had the money. It was good time Charlie kind of thing. But as soon as the money ran out, the friends ran out. The friends disappeared. He's left alone. All of a sudden he's there and he's all alone. Nothing else. He looks around. I got no more money. When he left the house of the father, he was, hey, I got lots of money, I got lots of things, I can do whatever I want. Now he's, I don't have anything else. I've got nothing left. Oh, and by the way, I'm getting hungry. He's starting to get hungry. No more money in the pockets. Can't buy food. He doesn't have the money for the food. The Bible says that he even looked at stuff that they were feeding the pigs. Pig food. And he wanted that. So oh, if I could if I could have some of that at least to fill up my stomach. They wouldn't even give it him. Bible says nobody gave him any. Think about that. He went from big life to no life. No, no, no. A little further on, verse 18. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go back to my father's house. Because at least the hired help that he has, they have more food than I do right now. So he wasn't going back to, to be as a son. He was aiming at to be one of the servants or to at least get the stuff from the servants, food from the servants. He wanted to be a servant. Think about that. He went from here to now he, he, he's willing to be a servant. You see the breaking in the person's life? See what the devil does? He breaks you, step by step. He breaks you. And he figures the lower you can, he, he can bring you, the better it is. That's what he was doing with this young man. Hallelujah. So he was determined to return to his father. So he did the steps to do that. He decided. Conscious decision. 
He made a conscious decision to leave, conscious decision to come back. Amen? He gets to his father and he says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. He didn't say, Oh, it's not my fault. <clears throat> they made me do it. <laughs> that my friends were real bad. He didn't blame it on friends. He didn't blame it on the circumstances. He blamed it on himself. Father, I have sinned against heaven and I have sinned against you. You need to realize if you look at the definition of repentance, mm -hmm. repentance is sin is taking you this way, repentance is doing this, going the other way. That's exactly what he was doing here. He noticed that, okay, this is where sin is bringing me. I, I can't go that way. I've got to go this way. He turned around and went the other way. Amen? After true repentance as evidence of a change of actions, not just by feeling remorse. Sometimes we go, oh, I feel so bad, Lord. I did that yesterday. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, I won't do it again. Next day, you're back there. That's lip service. It's not what God wants. God wants it from the heart. But the Bible says that, it goes a little further, his father saw him, and he was so filled with compassion, Luke 15, 20, that when the prodigal began the journey of reconciliation, key word here is began, the Bible says that his loving father rushed out to meet him. Now I was, I heard something the other day, that in those days, uh, a father, and especially in that tradition of nation, that the father, you'd never see an elderly gentleman rush anywhere. He wouldn't run. It was not done. They would walk. Here, the people that are watching the father should not understand that the father got up and started running towards the son couldn't understand that. He broke all tradition right there. And he did that. It shows you how much the father loved the son. How much his heart is open to forgive. Wow. He was overcome with joy that the son that was lost to him was now restored. The past was forgotten forgiven by the Father. In the tender embrace of the Father, the Father totally forgave the Son. I'm going to stop here for a minute on that story. And I'm going to share a little bit about, just a little bit, my wife. Prematurely, I was a premature baby. I was left in a, uh, a hospital and an incubator. And that's how my life started. Why I'm saying that is that I never met my mother. She left me in the hospital. She just left me in the incubator. That was it. I was gone. She was gone. So one of the main things that happens when that happens is spirit of rejection comes on me. And that's for real. Spirit of rejection is real. Believe. And it follows you until you can get rid of it. And it follows you to the point where everything that you encounter in life, you'll encounter rejection. 
It went on. From the hospital, I went through families like water kind of thing. <laughs> Up to the age of five years old. Maybe a family every three, four months, I would leave. Change families. In those days, they take the kids for uh, from children's aid for the money part. People would keep the kids for the money. The last lady that I left before I went to this family that I was five years old, uh, this last lady ended up, uh, they went to see her or visit me, and she ended up in the uh, insane asylum. She was that bad. So you can imagine the result of living with her, what happened to me. I won't go into the details, but it wasn't good, put it that way. So here I am, five years old, I finally get to this family. This lady takes care of me and she's very nice and the man is so-so, but at least they're nice. Three months pass, all of a sudden I walk into my room at the end of that three months, pull out a suitcase out of under the bed, put the suitcase on the bed and start filling it up with my clothes. My mother walked in, she looked at me, she said, what are you doing? I said, well, I've been here three months, time for me to go to my next family. See the rejection? It followed me from there. Well, no, 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 you're not going anywhere, so okay, fine. Let's go with that. During that time, I was told that my biological parents had died, which was okay with me, you know. I mean, they died, they died, so that's why I'm, I'm like this. So this goes on and on and on. Of course, being a young teenager, I got involved with the ministry at a very young age. I got involved with Catholic Church. I was an altar boy. It was good. It was great. Until I reached the age of about 14 years old. At 14 years old, I'm walking down the hallway in the house, and the priest used to come once a year to collect the offerings for the year for the, from the families. Priest is sitting in the living room talking to my mother, and she's telling him, "Well, you know, uh, I'm having trouble with him. He's, uh, you know, he's a teenager, and uh, I'm having problems with him. You know, the, the way he's acting, and so on and so forth." So the priest looks at her and he says, "Lady, you haven't adopted him. Send him back." <laughs> Rejection. It's there. I'm in the hallway. I heard this. I'm 14 years old. What do you think happened to me? I blew up. Needless to say, I was not a happy camper. So I got even with that priest, unfortunately. I did a bad thing. Because I was serving mass. It was at Christmas Eve. And uh, me and the other guy, we decided to get even with the priest. So. When it came time to communion, he went and poured a wine. You didn't have any more wine, because we drank it. <laughs> that was it. So I was excommunicated the next day. <laughs> but, you know, that was my way of getting back in. But the thing is, the worst part of all this is that it destroyed my relationship with God. It destroyed my relationship. I said, if that's the kind of God that this man serves, and I'm going to follow that in the way. I'm not going to follow God anymore. So the devil heard that coming out of my mouth. A week later, not too far away, a week later, a social worker from the Children's Aid Society says, uh, oh, i got to bring you to my office. I said, okay. Go down to her office, sit in her office. She looks at me with a big smile on her face. She says, so how things are going? I said, well, you know, not too bad, except for, uh, uh, you know, I'm mad at the church and people and whatever. She says, oh, mm -hmm. Then she puts this file in front of me, opens up the file. And she says, uh, by the way, your mother, she's on planet Earth, and she's living in Ontario somewhere. I said, what? She's not dead. Don't know who told you she was dead, but she's not dead. But now you're old enough to know that at 
least she's alive, but she left you in the hospital. Talk about rejection. Talk about instant hatred. Talk about for 10 years I've been lied to by the people that I'm living at that my parents are dead and they're not. Now I'm a teenager. Think about when you were a teenager if somebody would do say that to you. All of everything that you thought about till there, it's all stopped. Your whole world is just crumbled. I lost it. I really lost it. I lost it to the point where I said, okay, I don't believe in God. I sure don't believe in people anymore. I don't believe in anything anymore. I believe in me and that's it. So I start my downward spiral. Downward spiral took me into drinking and a lot of drinking. Drinking like, I don't want to go far that, but uh, let's just say that uh, case of 24 a night wasn't hard to do. At one point in time, I used to go out of work, 4 o'clock, go into the bar at 4.15, walk out of there at quarter to 7 in the morning to go back to work. That lasted quite a while. That's the life I Who was happy? The devil was overjoyed. The devil was overjoyed because he had nothing to do. I was doing it all myself. I was killing myself. And I was doing a marvelous job, so he didn't have to do anything. He just let me go. But throughout that time, throughout the space of from five years old on, God saved my life three times. Where I wish I should have died. Uh, one time I fell 15 feet from a barn, right down, head first on the cement floor, mm -hmm. right in front of the cows. Because we were playing hide and seek and I slid and I went <laughs> straight down. I'm supposed to be dead. I was. All I had was a very bad lump. But <laughs> <laughs> I was okay. I woke up. Another time I nearly drowned. Saw my whole life flash before my eyes. God got me out of there. Three times in a row, God saved my life. Just to let you know that your life is predestined. God knows what's going to happen. God doesn't give up. He's always there. He was there for me. At one point in time, this evangelist came to Montreal. My friend had invited me, my friend, which is my wife now, but in those days she was my friend. And God placed her, us in each other's lives, uh, to the point where every time something bad happened in our lives, we'd show up, we'd meet somewhere, all of a sudden, path right in front of us. And we'd help each other out. She invited me to this thing, she says, you want to come and see me sing at the choir? I said, sure, why not? Now, little to me, I thought about it, but a choir's got about a thousand people. Hello? <laughs> How am I going to hear her sing? <laughs> so I showed up there. I showed up at that choir. I'm sitting there, and there's all oh, these people that are there. Wow, this is really neat. And this guy's message in the front is, brand new beginning. Wow, brand new beginning. I'm sitting there, and I go, what a bunch of people. What a total. And I'm like this, sitting in the chair, my arms are crossed, and it's a wall. Why? Because of everything that I had up to that day. And I'm hearing him talk, and I said, oh, my God, this is, oh, this is terrible. He had a good message, but it was terrible as far as I'm concerned. All of a sudden, there's an altar call. 
all these people get up and they go to the front. I said, what are you, crazy? And I'm sitting there and I go, oh, when is this going to be over? I don't want to get out of here. All of a sudden, God starts talking to me. And I'm sitting there and I'm going, the words that are said something like this, Arel, are you happy with your life right now? Mm. I go, well, no, not really. Do you want to change it? Who is this? <laughs> he says, it's God. Are you real? He goes, yeah, it is. He said, mm hmm. He says, so do you want to change your life? I go, okay, I'll make a deal with you. So God says, oh yeah? I said, yep. He said, if you're God, uh, I want to meet you, you alone, right here. Think about this. There's a thousand people there. And I make a deal with God. God says, get out of your chair. For real? He says, I'm God. I don't lie. Get out of your chair. So I unfolded my arms and I got out of the chair. I said, oh, by the way, since I want to meet you, I don't want to talk to anybody. I see those people, there are counselors running to them or something like that. They got a st sticker there. I, said, I don't want to meet anybody. See, I'm making it hard for God. I don't want to meet anybody. God says, come on forward. I start walking forward. And as I'm walking forward, it's like I walked into a wall of that I had never, never experienced in my life. The more I'm walking, the more the love is getting evident. Mm -hmm. And I got to a point where I just stood like this and I started crying. Mm -hmm. And I'm crying, and I'm crying. And, and tears are flowing down my face. And all of a sudden, I just felt these two arms just take and hold me. I had never felt love powerful as that in all of my life. I just stood there. I couldn't move. I just stood there and said, oh, wow. And I'm crying. My friend in the, in the, uh, the choir, she's going, God, God. Send him a counselor, send him to him to be saved. She was freaking out. She didn't know. But we had talked about it. But do you see how God honors your heart? I stood there, and it was like a 35 story building. just standing there and I'm wow uh, the salvation prayer I said it directly to God I said oh, I want you I want you mm. that was it mm -hmm. God gave me that very moment all of what heaven had to offer Amen. just like that when we talk about the prodigal son where the past is forgiven and forgotten, it was at that point. My past went to the point where maybe a month later, two months later, I'm lying in bed in my apartment and I'm praying and I'm praising God and all of a sudden I stopped. And I said, God, 
wherever my mother is on planet Earth, I forgive her. Mm. What she did, I forgive. What I feel right now, I want her to feel this wherever she is on this planet. The joy, salvation, the full benefit of salvation, I want her to feel it now, this very minute. And I know without a shadow of a doubt, wherever she was on planet Earth, God touched her. God set her free. God set her free. God set me free. That's what the love of the Father can do. But a lot of times, we walk around with, they did this to me. They did that to me. Uh, I've been so hurt. But you know what? If you are willing to stand up and say, you know what? I'm going to forgive them. I'm going to let this go out of me because it's not helping me. It's destroying me. If I hadn't turned around, if God hadn't turned me around, I'd be destroyed. I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be doing and saying what I'm saying now. God had to, I had to say, okay, God had to talk and I had to, yeah, I make a choice. Either I do this or I don't do it. I did it. I tested God. If he's there, no problem. And he was big enough to handle no counselors. He came to, he came directly. The Father can do the same for you. The Father can set you free. Maybe there's somebody in your life that hurt you that they're not there today. Maybe they're gone. Maybe they're with the Lord. Maybe there's somebody that childhood that really hurt you. School, school buddies, peer pressure, a lot of that. Maybe somebody hurt you there. Maybe it's buddies at work, co-workers, that left you a lot of scars in your heart. The only way you're going to get rid of that, you got to forgive. What we do in a, in a Freedom Weekend is we have people stand here and you come up to them and those people represent the person that hurt you. It could be John, Jack, Bill, Harry, whatever. Uh, Samantha, George, whatever. That person represents whomsoever hurt you. And you know what the hardest part is to do? is to say, stand in front of that person and say, you know, okay, Jack, you really, man, you hurt me. You hurt me real bad. My, my father, the one that I stayed from five to whatever, was an alcoholic. And when he drank, he didn't want to be around me. I'm at the wall quite a few times. So you don't, you, it hurts. A lot of time it hurts deep down inside. It scars your heart. God's the only one that can remove the scars. We can, but God can't. Man cannot heal man. The creator can heal the creation. Amen. Amen. Yes. So as you as you come forward and say, you know what? Okay, you're Jack. Jack, you hurt me. But you know what? Today, I choose to forgive you. Do you know what that does? That sets you free, and it actually sets Jack free. It really does. We've had one encounter where this young lady came up, and she hadn't heard from the, the man that made her pregnant and she had a baby. And he was in another country. 
and she was in Canada. And she was really upset with him and everything else. And the person didn't want anything to do with her. And as she came forward, she said, okay, you're so-and-so. I said, okay, I'm so-and-so. And she started talking about the story. And I said, Whew. And then I, the Holy Spirit made me become him. And I started apologizing. And I started saying things to her that if he was him, he would say if God was touching him. It ended up, this was on a Saturday night, it ended up on a Monday morning. She got a phone call over from overseas, that man. And that man said exactly everything that I had told him. Amen. Word for word. And he came down and he wanted, he, he's taking care of the baby and everything else. He came down. He came down to this country. You see what forgiveness does? Forgiveness sets you free. I talked about freedom this morning. I talked about restoration. I talked about all of this. You know what? God set me free. And he can do the same for you. When the father saw the son, he put a robe on him, clothing him with new garments, free from the stench of his sinful life. Think about it for a second. What did God do for you when you got saved? What did God clothe you with? Amen? Yeah. He gave him a ring signifying the covenant that exists between the Father and Son. What did the Holy Spirit give you? Bible says you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> you got a holy ring. Wow. It says he put on shoes on his feet, representing his rightful place as a son. Not a servant. A son. Remember what the Bible says? The Bible says, the word says, we are called sons of and daughters of the Most High. We're not called servants. We're called sons and daughters. Amen? Amen. But you know that you can miss your divine destiny? You can miss because if you have failed to accept God's view of you, you can miss it. Many of us fail to understand God's eternal love for us and his desires. We can miss it. God loves us. The spirit of rejection is there to destroy us. Anything away from God is there to destroy. If you're in God's plan, Now, I don't know this morning who I touched, but I know God touched some people here this morning. If you have somebody that, as we're, I was talking, that God brought it to you, to your mind, to say, oh yeah, well, yeah, that person, I forgot to forgive that one. Lord, you need to do that this morning. When I was praying this week, God said, this is what I want, because I want the people to Last week there was restitution. This week you need to you need to be restored. Restored to what? Restored to a free person, a free human being. Because when you're free, you can help set other people free. Amen. Amen. Bible says, freely receive, freely give. That's where it comes out. It comes out to there. It comes out to that. So this morning, I'm going to stop it right here. And we're going to ask the leaders to come and stand here in front. And as the leaders come and stand in front here, basically, if you have something that 
you need to talk to you about it. Just say, you know what? <laughs> Bill really hurt me. I need to I need to get rid of this. Come on up. We'll pray for you. And believe me, the, the Holy Spirit is I I know he's here. I can I feel the anointing here right there. That God is here and he's here to say, okay, you know what? I'm gonna set you free today. And once you're free of that, you don't go back to it. I never went back. I <laughs> God when when God healed me of of when I said, Okay, Lord, for the for the whatever happened in my life, God removed the alcohol. God removed smoking. Like that. Never went to an AA meeting. Not in my life. People ask me, well, how did you stop drinking? I said, God did it. God actually did it to the point where I took a bottle. The last bottle I had, threw it down the sink. Never touched another drop. Didn't even feel like taking another drop. It didn't even bother me to take another drop. It was it. God removed it completely. Smoking, the same thing. God removed it completely to the point where I was working in an office, let's say, the size of this. The guy is sitting there, he's smoking so much you can't even see him in the smoke. <laughs> I'm sitting at his desk and he's looking at me all of a sudden on a Monday morning and he says, how come you're not smoking? I said, I quit. <laughs> well, how did you do that? I said, God, simple as that. <laughs> and he says, you don't, I said, no, I don't even care. You can smoke all you want, it doesn't bother me. And it didn't. It really didn't. So God could remove that so complete to the point where you're free. It starts with what? It starts with forgiveness. I'm telling you, forgiveness is, is such a powerful word. And it's a powerful action. And the people don't know how the depth of what forgiveness can do. But what it can do is it can set you free completely. So this morning, I'm going to ask the leaders to come up. And if you, if you want prayer, just come on up and we'll pray with you. And we'll let God be with you.